Hi, I'm uh, Timothy Baker. I came to China um, in 1988. My wife and I were teachers, and uh, we were teaching at a small um, school in Liaoning province in the city of Fushun. But really, our story started six years before that. In 1982, my wife and I uh, heard a speaker, kind of like this kind of thing. And um, that speaker was talking about giving up your life to help serve other people. And it was such a foreign concept to me. I, I, I never really had thought about it that much. And uh, that night, I went home and I prayed. I said, you, God, do you think that's something I should do with my life to give up everything to go and um, go somewhere else and help people who need help? And um, my wife and I gradually began to be more and more inclined to go this direction. And in um, 1984, um, I was working as the assistant manager of a supermarket. It was a great job. You know, I, I, I really was like living the middle class dream. You know, we owned our own home. We had two small children. My wife was able to stay at home and take care of our children. And, um, you know, everything was perfect. You know, we had two cars. You know, everything was great. And, um, but that calling on our life just began stronger and stronger and stronger. And in 1984, I told my boss, I remember the day I told him, I said, hey, Tom, um, I'm going to quit my job. And uh, my wife and I, we're going to go live overseas with our kids, and we're going to help people. And he said, what? Are you crazy? Why would you give up this good job? Look at all the benefits we give you. You have insurance. You have a pension. You make a good salary. Why would you want to do that? And... I said, well, I said, because I really believe I have this calling on my life to do something more with my life. And so we did. You know, I, I quit my job, and um, of course, um, I didn't finish college, so I went back to college. So now I'm 28 years old, and um, going back to college with a wife and two kids, that's not an easy thing. I don't recommend it that way. That was very difficult and very challenging. And, uh, but we did. We went back to school, and after four years of studying, uh, I was able to graduate. And during that time, I also did some volunteer work. I had uh, helped at the university. I'd helped Chinese scholars who came from China to study in, in America. These were visiting scholars. And a lot of them had studied English a lot, but they couldn't speak English very well. And so... Um, I began tutoring them, and they began to tell me about China and about the Chinese people, and encouraged me to come to China. Of course, I had no intention of going to China. I didn't really know that much about it. And then, during the senior year of my, my uh, college, um, we had another a speaker who came and spoke at our school, and he talked about teaching English as a second language in China. And I thought, wow, that, that sounds really exciting. That sounds like something I, I, I think I, I could actually do. And so uh, my wife and I talked about it. We prayed about it. And after that, it was like the doors opened up for us to go to China. Everything we saw was about China. All of our kids' toys came from China. Our, our clothes were made in China. We were craving Chinese food. It was, it was just the strangest thing. And we... Um, signed up to go teach in, uh, in China, and we were accepted. Well, we arrived in China in 1980. That's a picture of our family's first day in China. We had three small kids at that point. We had a little baby that was three months old. Uh, oldest daughter was seven years old, and our youngest, our middle daughter was five years old. It was, I think it was about 14 or 15 hour tr train ride from Beijing to Fushun. And uh, I didn't really know very much about Fushun, but I did know after I got there that we were the only foreigners in the entire city of two million people. And the reason I knew that is because when we got off the train, it was like some celebrity just showed up. There were crowds of people all pushing in, taking our pictures, and trying to figure out who these strange looking people were. Every day we lived like that. I remember one time uh, my wife said uh, she needed to buy some stuff for our kitchen, and so we went to the local department store. 
And most of you are too young to remember what China was like 28 years ago in the department store. But basically, the stores were like this. There, there's a counter in the store, and people work behind the counter. And all of the stuff is on the other side of the counter. And you would have to ask permission to see something if you wanted to buy it. And so we walked into the store. Of course, our our entourage of followers, you know, followed us into the store. They were watching us. And um, we saw uh, a frying pan. And uh, my wife said, uh, Tim, I want that frying pan. So I told the clerk, I said, we want to see that frying pan. And, um, you know, we looked at it and everything. It looked, looked good. And so we bought it. And uh, as we were walking out of the store, um, I turned around and looked and uh, about 30 people in our entourage were all buying the same frying pan. <laughs> So I suppose they thought, well, if that foreigner thought it was good quality, maybe it is good quality after all. After teaching um, during that first year in, in Fushun, my wife and I had a change of heart about what we wanted to do with the rest of our lives. And we knew that it involved China. We fell in love with China. We fell in love with the Chinese people. Our kids went to the local kindergarten, and uh, I taught at the local college. And uh, we lived in the local community. And uh, we made so many friends during that year. We knew that we were probably going to spend the rest of our lives in this country. Um, after our year in Fushun, we moved to the city of Beijing. And uh, when we, we were teaching at um, a very famous school here in Beijing, Beijing uh, Aeronautics University, Beijing Hong Kong Dashui. So during that time while we were in Beijing, my family and I decided that we wanted to do something good, you know, besides just teaching. We wanted to do something good. So we became volunteers at the local government-run orphanage. And um, you can see some of the pictures there, or back there, actually. I remember that first day when we walked in to this big room, and um, there were about 30 kids in that room. And uh, most of them were lying on mats on the ground, and uh, there were a couple of IEs there, a couple of nannies there, taking, taking care of those kids. And uh, all of the kids had special needs. All of them were handicapped children. And, uh, you know, the windows were open, and there were no screens on the windows, and uh, there were a lot of flies flying around, and some of the children needed to be cleaned because they were lying in their own feces. And uh, it smelled bad. Um, I had never been around children with special needs like that before, so that was intimidating. And I, I really felt helpless. I really felt like, what can I do to help these kids? And, and my wife and I, we ran outside the building, and we just went out, and, and we just prayed. We said, God, what, what can we do to help these kids? This problem here seems so big and so hopeless. And uh, we, we gained our composure, and we went back into the building. And we began to pick up some of those kids and clean them up and hold them and talk to them and play with them. And, and over time, got to know them and got to see that um, they, they weren't scary. They weren't intimidating. They, they, they were really beautiful kids. And... Uh, it was almost like they were treasures that were hidden away in a field. And um, that really inspired us. It really changed our lives. So much so that a year later, we actually brought one of the kids home. And uh, she's our, our daughter number four, you know, four, four daughters. And uh, Esther is her name. And she is now 24 years old. And she's studying to be a teacher in Austin, Texas. And um, when we brought Esther home, we kept thinking about the children that were with her in the orphanage. The child that slept in the same bed with her to her, her right side. The child who slept in the bed with her to her left side. Who was who going to adopt them? Who was going to take care of those kids? And so my wife and I, we began to really pray about quitting our teaching jobs, and possibly dedicating the rest of our lives to helping kids like our daughter Esther. And that happened three years later. We, uh, we quit our jobs at the Aeronautics University, 
and uh, we, we couldn't afford to live in the city of Beijing. I don't know if you know this or not, but back in, this is 1995, right? So back in 1995, foreigners could only live in housing that was approved for foreigners. They didn't want us living in, um, you know, some you know, low quality place or something like that. We could only live in those expensive places, right? And you know the rent cost in Beijing or in Shanghai for that matter, any big city in China is very high. Well, back then, if you were a poor teacher like we were, we, we worked at the Aeronautics University. I made about 700 RMB a month as a teacher there, right? And not very much. My wife made about 400. So we were just poor teachers. How could we afford to pay a few thousand dollars a month in rent uh, to live in Beijing? So we moved out to the countryside. And, you know, you get outside the city, the price goes down, right? So um, we get out to the countryside and we find this, it's actually a house, not, not an apartment, but a, a real house. And so we moved into the house and um, we lived in this complex and there were 50 houses all together inside of this complex. And, but our house and two other ones were the only three that were fixed up and people were actually living in them. The rest were, the other 47 were just empty houses. So we began doing our work of helping orphanages, right? That was what we wanted to do. And so we would raise money and then we would go to the orphanage and we would say, what do you need? You know, what are the things you need? And they would tell us like, oh, we need diapers or we need baby formula or we need medicine or we need cribs for the baby to sleep. And so we would buy those things for the orphanage. But over time, we realized that that was not really solving any problem. There's something better than that needed to be done. And uh, so one night, this was a few years later, one night my wife and I are having dinner with the developer of this housing complex that we lived in. And he made the statement, Tim, if there's ever anything I can do to help you, please let me know. And my wife is sitting next to me and she said, you need to tell him that he could give us one of those empty houses and we could go to the orphanage and bring kids to that house and we could take care of them. So we, I said that to him and he said, you want a house? I said, yeah. He said, okay, okay, I'll give you a house to take care of those kids. And so the next day, um, my wife said, Tim, you need to go and tell him I want that house. And she pointed to actually this house right here. And I said, Pam, I, I, don't, I don't think he was serious. I, I really think he was just joking, right? Uh, you know, he was just being nice. He said, no, 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 we're, we're going to get that house. You know, so go there and tell him I want the house. So I, I said, okay, I always do what my wife tells me. And so I, I, went, I went there and um, I said, hey, uh, hi, um, I'm here to, you know, to get the house. And he said, really? You want, you want a house? I said, yeah, I, I really want the house. He said, okay, which house do you want? And I pointed to that, that house, this house right here. He said, okay, I'm going to give you this house, and you can use it to help the orphans. Well, that house was just an empty concrete shell. There were no windows, no plumbing. There was no electrical, no paint on the wall, just an empty shell. So we had to raise some money, and we did. And it took us three months to decorate the house and fix it up. Well, we hired some nannies to come, some IEs to come to uh, help take care of our future kids. We did some training with them. And I was driving, I, back in those days, I used to drive a Jinbei, you know, the 11 passenger van, right, right? That's the best car in China, come on. It is, no, you seriously, you think about it, that Jinbei, it, it runs forever. It just keeps going all the time. And if it breaks, it's so cheap to fix it, right? It doesn't cost anything to fix it. And it holds a lot of people. So we drove the Jinbei to the orphanage and we said, hey, we're here today to, um, we'll take any kids that you don't want, any kids that you're finding trouble taking care of, uh, we'll take them and at our own expense, we will care for those kids. You don't have to give us any money or anything like that. And they said, okay. They loaded up our van with kids and we drove back to the house, and that's how the house started. And um, a little while later, uh, the man who donated the house, some of the people who worked for him, you know how sometimes people say stupid things, right? Well, they said, well, you know, Mr. Baker, 
the only reason why he gave you the house is he wanted you to fix it up. And then later he's going to take it away from you and sell it for a profit. Profit. I said, oh, well, that's not very cool. You know, I, I don't think that's right. And uh, sure enough, a, a few months later, he called me and he said, hey, I really need to talk to you about something. Now, I don't know if he was going to talk to me about that or not, but I was afraid he might. And uh, I said, listen, you haven't seen the house yet with the kids in it. I said, why don't we meet at the house? And uh, he said, sure, sure, let's, let's go to the house. And uh, so I told the IEs, I told the nannies, uh, when we go through the front door of the house, please tell the children to make sure they greet this man who gave them the house very well. And he, she, they said, okay, we got it, we got it covered. And so... He and I come walking through the front door. The door is open, and the kids come running out, and they're like, Uncle, Uncle, thank you for giving us this house. <laughs> and they grabbed him by the coattails, and he's down on the floor, and he's, you know, he's wearing a suit, you know, expensive suit, rich guy, you know, and his tie is crooked, his hair is messy, and there's kids with runny noses, and they're, you know, all of that stuff. And... Um, after about 30 minutes of playing with, the, with these special needs orphans, right, he looked over at me and I could see he had tears in his eyes. And he said, you know, I didn't come here today with this in mind, but I'm so deeply moved by what I see, I'm going to give you another house. And so he gave us a second house. Wow, I had no idea that was going to happen. What a surprise. And uh, so same, same story repeated itself, right? We, we raised some money and fixed it up and went back, drove that gym base, still driving now, and uh, loaded it up with kids, brought them back. He came, he saw it. I'm going to give you a third house. Yeah. But it didn't stop there. Later, we got a fourth house and a fifth house. Now we have five houses. We're taking care of more than 80 kids. Can you imagine taking care of 80 fit kids? What a big family that is, yeah. We had to get a couple more gin bays after that. that one was not enough for all 80. And uh, because our kids were growing up and some of them were being adopted, which is good, right? But some of them were not being adopted, right? And so we opened a school. We rented another house, a sixth house, and we, we made our own school. We hired teachers, and, and then we hired doctors, and we hired nurses to come and help us to do the medical part. And uh, everything's going great. You know, I mean, it was just like the perfect situation until one day, my friend who donated all of the houses, he said, uh, I have a favor to ask you. I said, sure, you know, any, any favor for you, of course. He said, well, I have a friend who wants to adopt a baby. Can you help her? I said, yes, I'll help your friend adopt a baby. So the friend came, and she saw all of the kids, and she chose a little baby, a little infant that was actually abandoned at our front gate. And this was really the only non-special needs, the only healthy child we had at the orphanage at the time. And I had to tell her, no, she couldn't adopt that baby because somebody else was already working on adopting that baby. Well, when the man who gave us the houses found out about that, he didn't really like that too much. And he said, uh, no, 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 we're not going to take no for an answer. You know, I did so much for you. You need to do this for her. I said, well, I, it's, beyond, it's out of my control. He said, well, if you don't do it, he said, I'm going to, you know, give you, you're, you're moving out. You know, I'm not going to do this anymore with you. And I thought, well, you know, I don't want to live like this anymore. You know, I, 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 we're going to go out and we're going to look for land. And we're going to build a new place, a place where we don't have to ever be under the fear of that kind of thing again. And so we did. We went out and we looked for land, you know, uh, just drove the Jim Bay, you know, all over the countryside looking for land. And we found three pieces of land, all within a five-minute drive of our orphanage. And we came back to the office, and uh, my staff and I, we got together, and we just prayed, you know, God, show us which piece of land we should use to build our, our new orphanage. An hour after we prayed that prayer, the local government from one of the pieces of land came over to our office, and they said, Mr. Baker, what's it going to take for you to build your orphanage on our land? 
I said, listen, we, we found three pieces of land. I said, um, I guess it's just going to be based upon whichever one's the cheapest, whoever gives us the cheapest price. And that guy looked at me and he said, how much do you want to pay for this land? Now, you know, in China, when somebody asks you a question like that, you always go for like half or below half. You, you <laughs> lowball them, right? And so I'm thinking to myself, uh, Tim, say half price. You know, start with that. You can always work your way back up. Uh, but before I could even say one word, that guy looked at me. He said, how about yi kuai chen? And I said, yi kuai chen? What? That's, that sounds like one dollar. But that, that land must be worth like a million dollars, right? Maybe yi kuai chen is another way of saying a million dollars. <laughs> And so I looked over at my Chinese assistant. I said, did he just say one dollar or a million dollars? He said, Tim, that's one dollar. That's a good deal. You should take it. And so we got the land for Yi Kuai Chen. It was 30 mu of land for Yi Kuai Chen. Yeah. Now, again, we didn't have any money to really build anything on the land. I don't know how that part was going to work, right? But... There was a little boy that came into our lives around the same time we got the land for Yi Kuai Chen. And he was abandoned in a field nearby our orphanage. And a farmer heard about this little boy on the outskirts of the village. And so he got on his bicycle, he rode out to the edge of the village. And when he got there, he saw this little infant, you know, just a little bit, tiny baby, lying on the ground in a cornfield in the rain, and there were about 40 people standing around him, and nobody was doing anything. And so the baby was badly burned in a fire. About 60% of his body was burned. And so the farmer picked up the little boy, got back on his bicycle, rode his bicycle back home, and he and his wife took care of the little boy for the next couple of days. Uh, after a few days, they realized that they had exhausted all of their resources that this little boy needed way more help than they were able to give him. And so they took him to the local village leaders, and they, and, and they just said, no, we, we don't have the resources to care for this little boy either. So the next day, they took the little boy to the city, and they left him on the doorstep of the civil affairs ministry. Uh, they're responsible for taking care of orphans, so they thought this is a better place to put him. Put him there, and they kind of stood back in the shadows and waited for someone to come. S Long, not too long later, somebody came and saw the baby, picked him up, brought him inside the building, and then they took the baby and brought him to the local orphanage. It just happened to be the same orphanage that my son is from. I, I have four adopted children from China, and my youngest son is from that orphanage. And so the orphanage director called me and said, hey, Mr. Baker, we have this little baby. He's really burned. Uh, we, we don't know what to do with him. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm coming now. And I jumped in my car. My assistant and I, we drove to the orphanage. We got there and we, and we saw this baby lying on a bed. And the burns were so bad that um, the blanket that he was laying on was wet, you know, from all of the burns. And uh, the baby was in pain, you know, crying. And so we, I, I picked him up and uh, we drove immediately to the hospital, went into the hospital, into the emergency room of the hospital and walked in and put the baby on the, the, the gurney. And when the doctors came out and saw that baby, they just went, oh, we've never seen a baby so badly burned like this. We give this baby less than a 10% chance of living. I said, it doesn't matter how much money it costs or what you have to do. I want you to think of this baby as your own son. What would you do to save your own son's life? And uh, so they did. You know, they, they really worked hard and tried to save the baby's life. And, but after a few days, they also realized that the burns were way beyond anything they could do to help him. And so uh, we, we decided to transfer the baby to the Beijing Children's Hospital, right? The Beijing Children's Hospital is the best hospital in China for treating burns. There's a burn, burn unit there. And so uh, as we were 
um, um, admitting the baby into the hospital, the head doctor there in the burn center, she pulled me aside and she said, Mr. Baker, why do you want to save this little boy? I, I mean, what possible life could he lead? Look at him. He's so badly burned. Wouldn't it just be better to let him die? I said, no. I said, you know, even if nobody else wants him, I said, my wife and I, we will adopt this little boy. And someday I'll see him running across a soccer field, kicking a soccer ball. And someday he'll go on to high school. And someday he'll go on to university. And, and, and someday he'll come back to China and tell the Chinese people that God had a plan for his life. His life was worth something. It was worth saving. And um, she looked at me. You know, she looked at me and she said, if he survives, it'll be your God who saves him because I don't think I can. And she took him into surgery. And, um, <laughs> after six hours of surgery, they had to amputate his left arm because it was so badly burned. They had to amputate half of his left foot, uh, all of the toes on his right foot, all of the fingers on his right hand. He had skin grafting. And I remember the doctor telling me, she said, Tim, that the next 48 hours are critical because the infection in his body alone could kill him. And I said, he's not going to die because there's people all over the world who are already praying for this little boy. And uh, guess what? I, I didn't have to adopt him. Actually, some friends of mine adopted this little boy. He's actually 14 years old today. And uh, there's a picture of him after he's recovering. There he is with his family. Um, and guess what? Not only can he kick a soccer ball better than me, but he can ride a bicycle, he can water ski, he can swim, he can do rock climbing, and he plays basketball on the school basketball team that he goes to. And yeah. I remember uh, sharing that story uh, when I was visiting California a few years ago. And this little boy, his name is Levi, by the way. His mom named him Levi. And um, he was actually at the event that I was speaking at, and I told that story. And that, that was actually the first time he had heard the story. And afterwards, he said to his mom, he said, wow, my life is really important, isn't it? And it's true. It is, right? I mean, think about it. Yeah, they could have let him die. And what, what, what story is that? Just another victim. But now look at him. He's a beautiful young man with a lot of future. He's in the top of his class academically. And uh, I mean, someday I hope he comes back to China to work with me at the orphanage. So Levi's story went out on this TV program in the U.S. at the same time we got the land for Equi Chen. And that TV station contacted me. Uh, by then, we had email, so it was easy to contact me. And they said, Tim, we have some money for you. Uh, people have been sending checks into the station uh, to help your orphanage. I said, that's great, because um, we have this basically free land, and we don't have any money to build anything on the land. I said, how much is the check for? They said, we have a check for you. It's for $268,000. I said, Wow. I, I think we might be able to build a building or two on our, our, new, our new donated land. Well, I, I met some people in Beijing. I met a guy who was the head of a French construction company, Lafarge. And they donated all of the cement to our project and all of the roof tiles and all of the sheetrock. And, uh, and then I met somebody from Nippon Paint and they donated all of the paint to our project. And then I met somebody from Schneider Electric and they donated all of the wires to our project and all of the switches. And I met a guy from a company called Sureblock and they gave us all of the block and all of the bricks to build the building at a wholesale price. So we were able to take that $268,000 and not just build one building, but we built four buildings. We built our guest house where all of our volunteers live. We built two children's homes and we built our office. 
around that same time, I met a guy uh, who was also helping us with that little burnt baby, Levi, right? His name is Rob Gifford. He was the national correspondent for National Public Radio in Beijing. And Rob told me at that time when we were taking care of Levi, he said, someday I would like to do a story about your orphanage and put it on NPR. And I thought, eh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little shy with the media. I don't really like that too much, you know, because you never know. The media, they always, they might want to make me look good and make everybody else look bad. I don't, I don't like that. I, I don't want to make anybody else look bad. So I, I said, no, I, I don't really want to do that. Well, a little while later, I was driving through the city of Beijing. You know, Beijing's big, right? It's got more than 20 million people. There's, you know, probably 15 million bicycles, a few million cars. And, you know, you're driving down the street, and I was, my assistant was with me, and I said, hey, whatever happened to that guy, Rob Gifford, right? He said, I don't know. We should contact him. And as we're driving, we look out the door, and there he is. He's walking by our van. I uh, said, so, wow, that, what a strange coincidence. We opened the door and he jumps in the van and we said, hey, wow, we were just talking about you. He said, yeah, you remember, I still want to do a story about you. Let me know the next time something big is going to happen. I said, I don't know what you mean by something big, but uh, in, in two days, we have nine babies coming from Henan province to our orphanage. I said, is that a big story? He said, yeah, that's a big story. I want to do a story about that. So he came and did a story about that, and it went on the radio on the second anniversary of 9-11. And that day, I received more than 2,000 emails. You, you never want to receive 2,000 emails, by the way. That's, that's very stressful. Um, but I did read every one of them, and I had people help me answer them. But I received one email from a guy um, who was, um, his family was from China. And um, in the early 1950s, they moved to Hong Kong, and then in the 60s, they immigrated to the United States. So this guy is uh, like you know, about my age, you know, so he grew up in, in America, and um, he, um, he heard the story about this American guy who went to China and was helping all these orphans, and he really felt convicted by that. He felt like, you know, here I am, I'm Chinese, I live in Los Angeles, California, and I'm not doing anything to help orphans in China. And I'm Chinese, I should do something. And uh, so he said, Tim, he said, let me know what I can do to help. I said, yeah, sure. I said, you know, for, for $35 a month, you know, 200 RMB a month, you can sponsor one of the kids to live at Shepherd's Field or at, at the orphanage. He said, no, 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 no. I, I want to do something bigger than that, bigger. I said, okay, I don't know what you mean by bigger, but for $200 a month, you could sponsor one of the houses, right? He said, no, 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 no. you don't understand. I want to do something really big. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, we're, we're building this new orphanage called Shepherd's Field, and we need to build some more buildings, right? He said, tell me about that. So I told him about that, and... Uh, he said, I want to build your clinic. So our clinic got built, the second one there. That's our clinic. It got built through the national public radio thing. So let me just give you a little, uh, a little background about Shepherd's Field. So we take in special needs kids from more than 30 orphanages across the country. And they send us kids that they really can't help. And... They don't give us any money for it. Uh, when those kids get adopted, we don't get any money for that either. We raise all the money to support them. 100% of the money that goes to support those kids comes from our organization. And um, in our orphanage, we have one nanny taking care of three or four kids instead of one nanny taking care of 20 or maybe even 30 kids. And so the idea there was to create a family environment, to make it feel more like a family. And um, that's what we've accomplished there. Those kids, when they come in, you can see on their face, they have like this, they, they look like they've been, well, they have, they, they've been abandoned. So you can see that spirit of abandonment on them. And when you, and when you love them and nurture them and care for them, it, it only takes a few days and you can just see their eyes brighten. They smile 
and uh, they're changed radically. One of those kids uh, was actually my son, Philip. This is my son, Philip. Uh, Philip, uh, my, my wife and I and my daughter, Sarah, found Philip in one of our orphanages that we work with. And the day we came there, the orphanage director told us that uh, this little baby uh, won't be here tomorrow. He didn't mean that the baby was going to leave. He meant that the baby would die because the baby was so sick. And um, we, um, we asked if we could take the baby home. And he said, yes, please take the baby home. So we took the little baby home. And uh, he was so weak, he couldn't even suck on a bottle. We had to feed him with an eyedropper. And, uh, but, you know, after a few days, that same thing happened. He, he began to look better, to f smile, and his eyes brightened up. And um, in, in um, I think it was six months later, we fixed his mouth, and, uh, and then we fixed his palate. And, uh, yeah, look at it, how beautiful he is. Look at that smile, right? You can just see the change in his life, right? Those kids, you know, people always say to you, or say to me, um, Tim, how can you love um, your adopted kids as much as you love your own biological kids? I said, well, don't tell my biological kids this, but I love my adopted kids way more than them. And, you know, I know that sounds funny, but there's some truth to it, too, because they came to you in such a special way. And, um, you know, we have other kids like that, too. There's a little girl who, um, uh, you know, we have a lot of volunteers who come to work at our orphanage. Uh, from April through September, that's our real busy season. We have people from China, people from America, people from all over the world come. Well, this little girl in the orange T-shirt, um, she came from America. She was 14 years old when she came. And uh, she was with a group of people. And every day she would go to one of the houses and meet this little girl who was three years old at the time. That little baby's name is Grace. And she was uh, also abandoned at our front gate. And Grace had five major problems with her uh, body. In fact, we called her the most expensive child that we have ever taken care of because she spent more than a year in the hospital. And, uh, but over time, Grace got healthier, she got stronger, and she survived. After this little girl um, spent two weeks with Grace, she went back to America and uh, she told her mother and father, she said, Mom, Dad, we need to go back to China, and my little sister is over there. We need to adopt her. And so the family did. They adopted Grace. And now today, um, Grace is nine years old. This is another one of her adopted siblings. And um, that's her family. Oh, beautiful family, right? Thank God for that family. And... Grace's life was radically changed. But, you know, the truth be told is, you know, because people say all the time, Tim, you did so much for those kids. You really did a great thing for those kids. Those kids are so lucky to have you. But the truth be told, those kids did way more for me than I ever did for them because they changed me. They gave me a heart that is, that is completely broken for the hurting and suffering in this world. And I don't look at those kids like there's something wrong with them. So, so many times people will come, they'll say like, oh, what's wrong with this child or what's wrong with that child? There's nothing wrong with them. There's something wrong with us. We're the ones that have the problem, right? We need to look at them as just like Levi, there's a plan for every child's life. There's a plan for every special needs person's life. And we can do great things to change their lives, sure. But those people will change our lives, too, at the same time. So um, now Shepherd's Field is finished, and we go to register all of the buildings. And uh, when we went to do that, uh, register everything with the government, they said, hey, wait a minute, you're missing a building. There's one building that's missing. Uh, I said, no. I said, I don't think there's a building missing. I'm pretty sure they're all there. No, you don't understand. When we gave you the land for Ikwai Chen, you were supposed to build this much uh, square meters. And I said, well, how many square meters are we missing? They said, 3,000. I said, what? 3,000? That's, 
That's bigger than all five of our children's homes together. That can't be right. We, we got to stop this from happening. We need, to, we need to complain about it, pray about it, and stop it from happening. We don't want that building. But then God reminded me that eight years before this, he gave me a vision for those older kids. You know, in China, when an orphan reaches the age of 14, they can no longer be adopted. If they're a healthy child, by the time they're 15 or 16, the government orphanage will find a job for them, a place for them to go and live, a place for them to work. If they're a special needs child, they'll end up going to an adult institution where they'll end up spending the rest of their lives, being warehoused in an institution somewhere without any opportunity to um, have a relationship, without any opportunity to have a job or to learn life skills. Uh, 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 or just any kind of social interaction with the outside world. They're just kind of hidden away. And so this new building is going, to, is going to help change all of that. This new building is going to be our vocational center where we will train those kids, give them job skills. We will teach them life skills. We will teach them how to live together in a group home and how to help one another and uh, how to be use, become useful parts of society. And uh, um, even though our new building is finished, it still hasn't opened yet because we're still going through the inspection process. Um, but um, we do have some of our kids who didn't get adopted who became older kids. We had, we had a little girl who came to us 10 years ago uh, when she was 14 years old. And uh, we gave her an education in our, in our school. Um, we, uh, we taught her life skills. We gave her job skills. And then when she uh, became um, uh, 20, 21 years old, we hired her to work at Shepherd's Field. And she worked in our office. And she was part of our guest relations team. And what she would do is when our local guests from Beijing or Tianjin or wherever would come to visit the kids, she would take them on a tour and she would tell the story about Shepherd's Field. And this little girl, uh, well, she's a woman now, she's in a wheelchair. She'll never be able to walk. And while she was with us, she learned how to play the piano and she learned computer. And now, just recently, she was able to find her own job by herself. She moved away from us. She left her family. And She's living independently. She rented her, she saved enough money to rent an apartment. She's going through training at her new job. I'm so proud of her. But that's what we want to see for most of those kids. I know some of them won't be able to do that, but most of them can do that. And um, so um, that's the Shepherd's Field story. You can see there's the whole place now. Uh, we're located just an hour from the Beijing Capital Airport in the, in the countryside of Tianjin. Uh, there's our contact information. I welcome you all to come. We love having volunteers. We love having guests. You don't have to stay overnight. You can even come for a few hours. Meet the kids. You know, there's a Chinese proverb that says, seeing something once is better than hearing about it a hundred times. And it's so true. When you see these kids, they will change your life just like they changed mine. Thank you.